Good morning, everybody. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us this morning. You're all very welcome. Morning, everybody. Just going to give it one more minute and then we'll we'll start. Thank you for joining us. OK. Guys, I think I'm probably going to make a start with quite a few people in and uh, we've quite a bit to get through this morning, so I'm just going to go on. Um, so. Just want to say good morning, everyone, and you're very welcome to today's event and um, like to say thank you for giving us your time this morning. We're delighted so many of you could join us and um, it's great to see so many representatives from major stakeholders and companies across Northern Ireland. Uh, we are recording today's event, so we will be able to share with people who are unable to make it. My name is Johnny Pardo, and I work for an ACRO on our ESF funded Working Well programme. And our aim is to reduce crime and its impact on society, individuals, families and communities alike. The focus of my role is assisting access to employment and education for people with criminal records. In 2019, Hannah Brown from the Ulster University Graduate Leadership Programme joined her team for a few months and we co-designed the survey together to ask what do employers want? Unfortunately, Hannah cannot join us this morning as she started her PhD, um, but we'd like to say a massive thank you to Hannah and to Ulster University for making this project possible. Hannah worked extremely hard. She contacted over 500 employers, conducted endless hours of background research, collated and interrogated the data, to the highest standards and produce the findings report of which you will all receive a copy after today's event. Every day across Northern Ireland, talented and hardworking people who have old or minor convictions are being overlooked for jobs to be perfectly able to do, and they would do them very well, and recruiters are still finding it challenging to fill many roles. There is also an issue that people do not apply for jobs or withdraw their applications as they believe they will not be given the same chance as everyone else. Can you see how something needs to change? And why is this, you might ask? Well, we had many preconceptions before we did this survey, so this is why research is so important. Asking people what they think and listening to the responses is key to problem solving. So we asked and many of you answered. I'll be honest, we were pleasantly surprised by the results, which are all captured in our short film today. Now let us talk about the elephant in the room, safeguarding, <clears throat> a subject close to my personal life. My sister Louisa was brain damaged at birth and requires 24 hour care. She's nonverbal, so I want to know the appropriate checks are being done for any staff who are around her unsupervised. If any staff had a pre previous record, I'd want to know that information would be properly risk assessed and cleared before they start to work with her. As a former HR manager myself <clears throat> and a brother to someone with special needs, I am not against appropriate background checks for regulated activity, and no one can deny the importance of safeguarding vulnerable groups. However, the overzealous vetting and exclusion of people with criminal records, blanket bans and using tick boxes to screen out people at the initial stages of recruitment is unhelpful and unfair. Um, we have developed some um, products coming out of this research. So Niacro is working with uh, Sean, Sean Walsh from Elite Training. So Sean's on the call. Thank you for joining us today, Sean. He's kindly building an online convictions calculator which should be launched very soon and will allow, allow employers and people with criminal records to anonymously check if a conviction is spent in NI. We believe this will be helpful to many people. Giving employers more resources like this online calculator, training and support to work out a recruitment strategy that is both fair and, and safe is vital. We encourage employers to abide by the Access and I code of practice and make themselves familiar with their tool for assessing criminal records. We recognise that each business has its own unique needs but there are common basic principles that are helpful to all. We hope that out of today's launch, many more conversations will take place both locally and nationally to see how we can recruit in a way that is fair, safe and consistent. We have a lot of good stuff to get through today. Niacro CEO Alwyn Liner will share some reflections after this introduction, followed by our short film. 
After the film, we'll hear from our three excellent panel members before hearing the personal testimony of how difficult a conviction can be for someone even almost 30 years after the event. We will hand you over then to uh, the chat function and Claire Bowles will be taking the, uh, the questions from, from you guys. So I just want to say a few big thank yous today and if we could get that second slide up, Alison, that'd be fantastic. Um, if that's possible. Super. We just want to acknowledge uh, our funders here at NIACRO for the Work and Wild programme. So, um, Department for Economy, Department for Justice, Pilgrim Trust, PBI, Prison Service, and ESF. Uh, without these funders, or this would not be possible. Uh, the second slide I would like up next would be just to thank everybody who helped us promote this uh, survey. So as you can see, Human Rights Commission, Equality Commission, Access and I, uh, Business and the Community, Probation uh, and many others helped us to promote the survey, which uh, led to a very good uptake and responses. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Ulster University for their amazing support throughout this project, especially to the PR and events teams. So that's Claire Bowles, uh, Lee Campbell, Kira Gary, Alison Mills for hosting the event and to Mark Weir for, from UU for shooting and editing the video. I'd like to thank all everybody who's taken part in today and promoting the survey and I'd like to thank you personally for attending and I'll now pass you over to our CEO of Niacro, Alwyn Liner. Thank you. Thanks Johnny um, and welcome everybody and thanks for the opportunity to be involved in, in this today. Uh, so as Johnny said, I'm Alwyn Liner and I'm the CEO here at Niacro. And I can confirm that we've had a long history of interest in the work that we're talking about today. In fact, this is our 50th year. And in this last year, we've worked with over 7,000 individuals, uh, as well as working with them in relation to uh, employability services. We provide a wide range of other services to adults and to families of those in prison and to young people. In the area of young people, we support models of early intervention that demonstrate that if services can be offered to families and children before key relationships break down in schools, in the community and at home, very often future problems can be averted. And it's important that we focus on that because in Northern Ireland, we have one of the lowest ages of criminal responsibility, which is set at 10 years old. So whether we consider today the criminal records that folks may have to disclose, some of them will have been uh, gathered up at a time when they were young children. I want to just take a moment to recognise the wide range of participants and interest that this research project has demonstrated, uh, has generated, demonstrated by the number of people involved today. I also think it's worth noting, as Johnny has reflected, on some of the and many valuable partnerships we need to have to support those with records to progress into work, education and training. And this partnership with the University of Ulster on research is just one of them. It has been really valuable to have a third party to ask the questions and now to support us in the delivery of the findings. On other days and on other occasions, we focus on, on other partnerships. But this today is about what will help persuade employers to fairly recruit those with convictions. And it's that relationship with employers, which is one that we need to focus on every single day. There is the potential for significant engagement given the current labour market shortages where folk we engage with may well have the skills that are needed to fill some of those shortages. Without understanding what will encourage those who are involved in the recruitment process to engage with those with records, we're missing a trick. But other research helps us too. We should know that very few folk with criminal records commit offences within the work environment. And further, having a job and a sense of purpose are both very significant contributions to the, reducing the likelihood of reoffending. So this work and the messages that are emanating from today really matter. So thanks to everyone for participating and thanks very much to our panel who are going to participate in the discussion later on. And I'll hand you back over to Johnny. Thanks, Alwyn. Really appreciate that. Now we're going to show you a short film that uh, we made a few weeks ago and uh, we hope that you enjoy this and I'll leave it over to Kira to start the video for us please. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Johnny Pardo. I work for NAACRO on the ESF funded Working Well program. We would help around 900 people a year try and access employment and education, and those people have been involved in the justice system. Over the last few years, I've helped hundreds of people look for work and help them with disclosure, and found a lot of people who had maybe committed very minor and offences a long time ago were being turned down for work, you know, at the, at the first point, and um, they were being filtered out of this uh, out of the application and recruitment process. And then when I discovered the Ulster University Graduate Leadership Programme and that Hannah was coming on board, I decided, you know, to use Hannah's skills to do research into, you know, the actual behaviours and attitudes of um, employers when it came to recruiting people with criminal records. So I thought it'd be a good use of her time and our time to do some actual in-depth research and study into the reasons why people do or don't give people a job when they have a criminal record. I suppose a couple of things surprised me. One was that uh, so many employers, uh, unfortunately, won't give someone an opportunity to explain themselves. So many people ask at the application stage and 64% of them don't actually give any but someone an opportunity to explain their, their criminal record or their conviction. They just ask them to list or tick a box. Um, and that, that sort of surprised me how many employers did that. But actually that backs up the second point, which was that people feel they don't have enough knowledge and they don't have enough information to make those decisions about hiring. And so what we identified from the research was that employers themselves told us that if they had more information and more training, they would be more confident and they did want to employ people with criminal records and they want to give people a second chance. So overall, it has been a very positive survey um, and we would always encourage best practice and we would encourage people to give people a second chance. So the report was drawn up in December 2019, obviously early 2020, the pandemic hit and we, we weren't able to do as much as we wanted to, but already we've adapted uh, the findings into our own research, into our own uh, resources that we give people, the training that we provide for employers, and we take the information from the survey and use it to kind of drive ourselves on, even even the fact that like, you know, so many people want to give people a chance, it's very heartening for us just to see that There's so many employers out there who really do want to do something about this, give back to society, help people get back, get, get their lives back on track, but they are nervous. So we try and adapt all our resources to kind of give people, employers that help that they need. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm a student with Ulster University. I started working with NIACRO as part of the Graduate Leadership Programme. I had recently graduated in psychology and just was really keen to get some research experience just to kind of build my career on. So I found this um, through that program and started working with NIACRO then. There was a lot of surprises in the responses from the organisations. The main one was just how many of the companies required a disclosure of convictions. And um, from our point of view, maybe a lot of the organisations, it wasn't really necessary for them to ask someone if they had a criminal conviction. So it just shocked us how many asked when they didn't necessarily need that information. The second thing that shocked me the most was just how little it would take um, employers to consider hiring someone with convictions. A lot of them said they would be willing to hire someone with conviction. They just, 83% um, said if there was some sort of proof of rehabilitation, they would consider hiring someone with conviction. So that would maybe be, we had done some research on maybe a certificate of rehabilitation to show that they hadn't committed any more offences and they'd maybe done some courses and things. So that seemed to make a big difference. Seventy-eight percent of them said that they would be willing to hire someone with conviction just if they had more information and support. So it just shows how little it would take just to really increase the chances of some of them hiring someone with conviction. I learned a lot from undertaking this project and um, this was obviously my first research job so it was just such a learning curve to see research kind of come from the ground up and being able to go with it from design right through until you know like now making the videos and kind of publicizing it a bit more so it was just so interesting to see all the different factors involved in that but it was also just all the conviction kind of side of things I didn't know anything really about that area or um, convictions in general.
even in terms of how long they may stay with you. It could be a very small, you know, a motoring conviction or something like that, and that can stay with you for years. So there was just so much I learned from the whole sector as well. Um, my name is Michael Dean, Managing Director of Dean's Restaurants in Belfast. Yeah, I suppose we, we, we probably maybe had people come through with criminal records that I didn't know about, but my first big experience of employing somebody with a criminal record is when one of the, uh, the food, top food critic in Belfast asked me to go and judge a cooking competition in one of the, 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 the prisons just outside Belfast um, because he couldn't go. And um, I, I noticed when I get into the building, I mean, of course, it's a, it's a different feeling and walking into a hotel or a restaurant and um, but i must admit i noticed a bit of, when i was in there was three boys cooking a competition and i noticed there was a bit of talent especially from one of them he actually had a red um t-shirt on and he was said he was a, like a michelin star prisoner he cooked for the officers and whatever he was a bit more aloof than blah 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 and he won the competition even though there was no knives in the kitchen there was no salt there was no pepper it was just it was quite a quite an intimidating environment but um there was a lot of um common thread with all the guys that the, the, the self-esteem that they had out of doing the cooking competition so we weren't allowed of course to ask why the guys were in whatever um and the guy who won the cooking competition competition still works here to this day um seems to be getting on very well and he, he just treated like like all of the rest of them um he, he steps out of line about anything it would be the same as he stepped out of line about everybody else did so at the end of the day he's a human being who maybe made a mistake um Humans make mistake. Human error is a common cause, and I, I, I would continue to do that. I don't have any um, issue with that. And we, we, we have to treat individuals as individuals. So we have an HR department which looks over that the people are treated with a bit of respect, no matter no matter what their background. So yeah, more of it. Well, I always employ people through, as I say, on an interview, how they interview and how hungry they are and how they want to adapt to that lifestyle. And it should never be judged by their past. I mean, we've employed people from maybe a two or three star Michelin restaurant and they've come in and they behave like a lunatic or have an ego or they have this. Why does somebody not deserve a chance who's come from a, a difficult background? And Belfast full of people from difficult backgrounds. We've been through the places like the Princess Trust and we've had a lot of people on board through that and um, have gone on to do very well. And let's hope they're the backbone of Belfast going forward. Thank you. Um, hopefully everybody uh, was able to hear and see that. Um, so I'll just ask the uh, panel just to switch their cameras on and my microphones on. That's OK. So Sarah, you popped up there first. So I'm going to introduce you first. This is Sarah Nielsen. She's Employability Manager for Business in the Community of Northern Ireland and heads up the Van the Box campaign. Is there, anything else, is there anything else you'd like to say about yourself, Sarah? No, I think you've covered it. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks for having me this morning. No problem. And um, we have Professor Duncan Morrow from uh, Ulster University. Uh, would you like to say just a little bit about yourself, Duncan? Yeah, I'm the Director of Community Engagement as well as a Professor in Politics, but I've had uh, on and off quite a long experience with the Criminal Justice System. I'm a Parole Commissioner and I'm also a uh, I've, I've done a number of things in restorative justice and different aspects of the whole criminal justice system. Thanks, Duncan. And we have Michael Dean. Uh, good morning, Michael. How are you, Johnny? Are you well? That was a no. very good presentation. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to just say a couple of words about yourself, Michael? Well, I'm just the one you saw in the video there, just uh, <laughs> talking about uh, about things in general, believe it or not. Um, yeah, I'm Managing Director of Dean's Restaurants in Belfast. Um, been a very difficult time through COVID and everything else, um, but but we're still going. and. Um, there you have it. We'll only give everybody a chance, and uh, I think this is a very good presentation today, and I'm glad to be part of it. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Michael. I'm going to put the first question to Duncan. So, Dun Duncan, obviously, we've done a bit of research here. Um, in your opinion, how important is research when it comes to issues like criminal records and recruitment, and how do you see it having an impact on the real world? Well, I think the real world impact is the key issue, is that really uh, by raising the, some of these issues up in a way where people can grasp them and see them in the patterns and seeing what's going on, you actually get a chance to uh, engage us across the whole of the sector. So we know from this research, for example, real things that the issues we have to address are issues of fear, issues of not knowing, issues of the, 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 the number of people who are actually using this box without really understanding some of its consequences. So those real world consequences are really important. And for us, 
in the university. I suppose this graduate leadership program is about a way of showing the research isn't just an ivory tower. It's actually about, you know, this is useful, useful to somebody like yourself who's got to do this as their job, but also useful in the long run to actually changing it for employers because we can see actions out of it. So, yeah, research can be in this point a real bridge, I think, from the theory to the practice. Thanks, Duncan. And I'm going to ask you a second question now. So you are actually a parole commissioner. Um, yeah. And so I'd ask you in your experience in this role, how relevant is, is the fear factor in decision making in this area? Well, I think um, part of the problem is if you meet people in the abstract, a prisoner, a criminal, then those have uh, associations with them. So obviously people are interested about, are worried about safeguarding and so on. But my experience in the Parole Commission is that literally every case is different and that therefore you're not dealing with uh, something in general, you're dealing with somebody who is a real person and uh, there may be real reasons and people have uh, moved on in their lives, people are ready, people have made mistakes. And actually, I think there are lots of ways for people to demonstrate that and lots of people coming out who really need that opportunity. And in fact, if we want uh, people to to move on, it's really important. Jobs are really important. So I think getting it to the point where people are being dealt with as a person with their whole history rather than just being dealt with as a, uh, as, a as an abstract. That's really something I've really learned from the Parole Commission. There isn't two people alike. There are exactly like in ordinary life. There are people who have the skills and the capacities and the appetite, as Michael said in the video, and that's what we have to get to. And and in leading up to the preparation for this, you had said, you know, when you use a tick box, you're creating a category uh, rather than seeing a person. And... Absolutely, especially if it's a kind of a category which raises fear. I mean, I think that part of the problem is how do you create a situation where people can ask totally legitimate questions? Of course, safeguarding, as you said in the video, is important, but those can be asked in a way which is actually connected to the person rather than dealt with as a type. One of the things I suppose in Northern Ireland that we've had to learn is if people are dealt with in terms of stereotypes, you get all sorts of di direct and indirect discrimination. And I think what we've had to do is get over that, get to people looking at their qualifications on the job and the person who's in front of you, and are they the right person? So for me, the issue of uh, the box ticking is that it kind of runs contrary to every other type of equality issue that we try to deal with. We try to say, you know, let's deal with the person and what they're doing. And actually, I think in this case, it's to the benefit of everybody. If you look at Timpsons over there in, in England in the, sh in the shoe shops, and they recognize that actually there may even be more appetite for people to keep their job sometimes. So that you need to kind of get to that point, I think. Thanks, Duncan. Sarah, can I can I come to you next? Is that OK? Yeah. OK, so very simple question. What is Ban the Box? <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Well, um, it's a campaign that was launched in England back in 2013. Um, and so far, it's positively impacted on about 1.2 million roles for people with convictions. Um, and the box, ca the campaign itself calls on businesses to give people with convictions a fair chance to compete for the jobs. Exactly the sort of thing that Duncan's just been talking about by removing that tip box from the application forms that asks about the convictions. When you ban the box, um, criminal convictions do not form part of the range of information that is taken into account when a candidate first applies for a job. Their skills and their abilities are considered first and giving people an equal opportunity to get to an interview based on the competency for the role. Positive disclosure of unspent convictions can be requested as required and as relevant to a job role, um, but at a later stage in the application process. And by asking about criminal convictions later in the recruitment process, employers are much less likely to write off talented candidates unnecessarily. The campaign itself can benefit both employers and employees and particularly people with convictions. Employment, as we've heard, is a crucial opportunity to reduce the likelihood of an individual reoffending. It also gives people with convictions the chance to reintegrate into society and support themselves and their families. So giving people a chance to get a job based on their merits rather than excluding them because of an unrelated conviction, provide hugely important benefits, not just to the individual, but the wider community too, in that it'll create safer communities, create less crime and less victims. So by having a fair and open recruitment process, it can help the businesses to attract a wider, more diverse talent pool at a time when a lot of companies are struggling to fill their vacancies. 
Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to throw a surprise question in here as well. Um, so obviously, I think sometimes when we when we we hear the word ex offender or people with convictions or people with criminal records, we jump to prison. But um, as you know, you know only about eleven percent of uh, cases will end up in a, in a prison sentence. So we're not just exclusively talking about people who've been to prison. We are talking about you know cautions and that kind of thing. So there, there is a wider wider aspect than just the, the, just prison. Would, would you agree or? Absolutely. Um, I do think so many people, I mean, in this day and age, we work, watch far too many crime dramas on Netflix and television, and we jump to huge assumptions about somebody with a conviction um, runs around in an orange jumpsuit and has created and done some heinous crimes. Now, there are people out there who have made bad mistakes, but ultimately, as you have said, most of the people that have a conviction in Northern Ireland are not a custodial sentence. Um, they're people with motor offences, they have fines, um, and that's the sort of thing we want to kind of avoid, is making sure that people understand people with convictions are just like you and me. Um, and we're not saying don't ask about convictions, don't, don't, but just don't make their criminal record the first thing that you know about them. Um, we really recognise the fact that for regulated roles employers have, they should complete criminal co records checks, exactly what you said for safeguarding for the likes of your sister um, and Access and I will do that and it's all done to make sure that we, we meet the legal requirements. Um, but ban the box isn't calling for changes in the checks and the processes that are legally required. Um, it's all about giving people fair and equal chances and just making sure that we understand um, some of those misconceptions. As I said, 54.54% of people in 2019 in Northern Ireland who went to court had a monetary fine and only 12 I think it's 12.9% had a custodial sentence. So we just need to understand um, that people with convictions are people like you and me, and they deserve a second chance to be able to, to move on with their lives. Um, and if we do the things properly um, and we make a decision about one is the role regulated, does it need to have a check done? Um, and if it does, what questions do we need to ask? And then we can make an informed decision about, you know, do we go ahead and make, make that kind of, um, conditional offer or permanent offer. Um, it doesn't benefit, the tick box doesn't benefit anybody at all. Um, it doesn't provide the necessary information to make an informed decision. Um, and I think I'll go back to what I said to start with. Um, don't make a criminal conviction the first thing you know about someone. So just to be clear, you're not saying to people don't ask or don't ask about convictions at all. You're just saying be more thoughtful about your process. Absolutely. Be more thoughtful and make sure that you you ask the question if you need to ask the question, but not every role in Northern Ireland has, has that requirement upon it. So just think about the person as an individual and think about things on a case by case basis. And are they the right person for that job? And then if you need to look at checks, do that if, you, if that's the requirement of the role. Thanks, Sarah. Michael, just maybe share couple of your personal experiences. I know you shared a bit on the video, but it, it's great to have on, on, on the panel as well today. And um, just if there were employers out there who are just worried, they think, well, if I if I go down this road, what 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 can I expect? You know? Well, you know, hospitality itself, the, the environment of hospitality can be uh, a difficult place. It can be kitchens can be um, highly tempered, highly fueled. Um, sometimes environments are very difficult to fit into. Um, a lot of people who start in hospitality are from difficult backgrounds w without having a criminal record. Um, and that, that's sadly the case. There's um, a lot of issues with drugs and alcohol in hospitality, um, which, which forms its own problems. Um, so what, what we, I mean, our HR departments work very close with everybody in all of our departments. And because someone has a criminal record who has made a mistake or has had difficult times, it doesn't really make any difference to us whatsoever. But coming in and being a team member, the team members are still individuals and that, that, that's a difficult thing. Um, and for other team members, maybe to know that people have had difficult backgrounds because people talk, they're very close. These people are in kitchens maybe 15, 20 hours a day. So the relationships all become very tight and um, people's whole personalities become exposed and maybe they're maybe that that shouldn't really happen but that 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 does happen so it, it's a very very difficult road what, what what i would probably like to see you know coming out of this is maybe to work with some of the the colleges where um the atmosphere um and maybe with university of ulster um because they do some great courses there as well that we could that could not, not i don't like the word halfway house but like a a, a, a training ground to get people up the speed before they enter the environments of a kitchen 
where the, the atmosphere can be white hot and then they're just dropped in there and left alone. Um, I, I, I think that would be a good, if it was a, a maybe a six week block period that we could do that. Like like ordinary guys do after the, um, they leave college because th- th- this industry is not for everybody and it, it can be, um, it can be difficult at, at the best of times. The hours can be long. A reputation hospitality is, is not a wonderful one. But I mean, what I always say to all our guys and even the guys who we have here at Criminal Records, you know, you, you can travel the world in this industry. You'll have grub in your belly. You'll have a pine note in your back pocket. You'll, you'll meet everybody. And um, the people that I've seen come through here who have got difficult backgrounds and convictions have, 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 always, have always done very well. And we've never had any... Um, any second issues. Mm-hmm. I'd, li- I'd like to reiterate the value of work experience. Uh, funny enough, when I was about 15, 16, I wanted to be a chef and I did a two weeks work experience in Jury's Hotel in Ballsbridge in Dublin. And after two weeks, mm-hmm. I decided it wasn't for me. It was to, it was uh, quite a quite an interesting environment to work in. So fair play to you. Um, I suppose the, the other question I'd like to ask you is just um, you know, the, when we talked before as well, we talk, the idea of maybe giving people trials or, you know, sort of, um, you know, I think you talked about your recruitment process was, you know, people would try for a day and things like that. What, what, do you, what do you think about that kind of idea for other kind of businesses where if somebody was in doubt about somebody like they liked what they saw, but they were just a bit iffy, um, is, is there a possibility of doing something like that, do you think? Well, I think we had someone actually in for, for a trial yesterday. We, we, we bring them in, we'll have a look and... Um, I, I myself can sort of tell when I meet somebody how good or how bad they're going to be um, within the kitchen, nothing to do do with a record. But um, I, I mean, I think when I spoke to you whenever we, um, we first met and I, I spent those 10 or 15 years in, in London hotels and when you, when you went there as an Irishman or an Ulsterman or whatever you classified yourself as in the early 80s, you, you were treated like a criminal anyway, every, every step of the way. So that's how I feel that I have some sort of understanding about this, because every day I went into work, they were telling me they were going to be looking underneath my car, they were going to be this, they were going to be that. So it's adapting the mind and put their mind in the right place to take it forward every day. And if someone has got a good mind and someone wants to learn and get, get stuck in and make a career of it, it shouldn't make any difference whatsoever in the background. Yeah, a key thing you've said for me there is about meeting people and, and, you know, evaluating people. And I think that's where the tick boxes fail, you know, because you haven't met the person, you've just seen a tick or you've just seen a list of convictions. You haven't met the person, you haven't. So I, I think it is what you're saying is very valuable there about, again, going back to what everyone's really saying is that treating people as people uh, and not not just uh, pigeonholing people. So. Very good. Well, listen, thank you very much, panellists. I'm going to ask you to turn off your cameras again because we're going to just go and play a short audio clip. Um, This is a service user, um, someone who used our helpline in Niacro. Uh, The the slides would explain it, but essentially this person got a conviction uh, almost 30 years ago and still had trouble with it there very recently. So if we could just play the audio clip and then what we'll do is we'll move then to Claire feeling the questions. Uh, out to the panel. So thank you very much. It's easy to think when you're 18 years of age that you're above the law or it's something that you don't worry about because when you're 18, you never worry about your future. You never worry about what you're going to be when you're in your 30s or your 40s. But believe me, it's something that really that most people should be thinking about, you know, because if you get yourself a criminal record, you're snookered. That's as simple as that. Being able to continue in my job at that moment in time was the only thing that I wanted. I, I wasn't with my fiancé at that stage. It was my only goal. It was my only concern. It was the only thing that I cared about. And since being able now with Niacro helping me and being able to sort out my criminal record past, then I was given the breathing space 
to one grow my business which i was always petrified of doing because here we go again with another place check i'm gonna have to go through all this crap over and over again where i don't need to worry about that now with growing the business then came back a bit of self um esteem and, and when you've had the wind knocked out of you that many times um it's nice to be able to sit back now and breathe and know that there's nobody chasing me anymore beforehand for 30 years i was constantly looking over my shoulder waiting on being called out waiting for somebody to find out that i had a record waiting to find out whether i was going to lose a job and i think in all honesty that drugs are the worst one that you can have it doesn't matter if you get caught smoking a spliff it doesn't matter if you get caught you know on a class c b or a drug it really doesn't matter i think a lot of people out there are thinking oh no it's okay it's only dope let me tell you you have a record you have a record and it doesn't say what you have the record for people don't care in everybody's eyes you are just a drug addict regardless and you you'll just you'll just have an eternity of not being able to get a job i very naively whenever we all four of us got done at the time obviously when we we got done in the high court uh, and <laughs> imagine you're standing in front of like a hundred crumblies as we would have called them back then um genuinely thought when it was sort of like well you've got six months and um we're going to thank it for two years i thought oh great well we'll just not get into trouble for two years you know, it'll be on our record for five years and then we'll just skippy dippity do on with our lives. It's just not what it is at all. You're punished. You are punished for the rest of your lives. There is no end game. There is no, in five years, this will be off my record. There is no, in 10 years, it will be off my record. It's always on your record for the rest of your life. It is as simple as that. People have labeled you before they even know you. They just see your name on a piece of paper. They see your charges. And in all honesty, if there's another candidate sitting beside you and they don't have charges, that other candidate's going to get the job. You'll not even get an interview. It's as simple as that. It's very easy for me to sit here and say, I just don't do it. Well, I think we all find ourselves in situations um, where there's either peer pressure or you find yourself you know, trying to impress somebody or maybe you're just in a terrible position in your life. And that's, that's what headed me down that road. Unfortunately, you know, we, we, we go down paths sometimes, whether it's just the once or whether we do it all the time, and we make mistakes and people make mistakes. Because Niacro, in all honesty, is probably the only reason why I'm still alive right now. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully that was uh, eye-opening for some some people. Um, <clears throat> not, not unusual of the calls that we would get. Uh, I get to Niacro. I think just to say that it's it's a it's not that um, the person is is not able to to cope sometimes, but it's just because they've been feeling judged, um, you know, by so many people. They do sort of come to the end of their tether a wee bit. And again, just to reiterate, we're not we're not you know we're not recommending circumventing safeguarding or or that kind of thing, but just you know making sure that processes are fair. Um, Claire, you you have a few questions yeah. uh, for us. Yeah. So first of all, thanks everyone for participating in the chat box. It's been a lively chat so far. First thing to say, I suppose, and um, to answer a couple of questions from Kiva and Stephen, um, we will certainly make copies of the research findings available alongside the video um, that you saw at the start of this presentation and also a recording of this event as well. Um, and we'll also, of course, ensure that there are contact details for both Austria University and Niacro in that any support or any further questions that you have, you'll be able to follow up. So we'll do that after the call. Um, so then I'd like to move on to a question from Louise. So she says, thank you, really interesting research. Um, interesting in certificate of rehabilitation, proof of some courses. What do you envisage this to look like? Are there barriers to accessing education and training qualifications for people with convictions? OK, would you like me down to the certificate one? Yes, because um, we did the research in that. So in California, what what, has, what they've made possible is if somebody is convicted and then after a certain rehabilitation period, like maybe a number of years, they are entitled to um, go back to the court and apply for a certificate of re rehabilitation, they must have not been convicted in that pre previous time and um, they must provide evidence uh, references um you know 
things that they've been doing, like jobs, if, if they've gone to maybe, I don't know, alcoholic anonymous or narcotics anonymous, if they've, they, they present all the evidence that, look, I am not the same person as I was when this happened. And the courts can actually issue a certificate of rehabilitation. And then that is used then for employment purposes. And they did a survey in California after this project had been going for a while. And they found that if someone had a certificate of rehabilitation, they had the same chances of getting the job as someone who had no convictions. So it was a bit of peace of mind for, for the employer, you know. Um, and Johnny, just reflecting on the fact that 83% of, of, of employers in Northern Ireland have said that proof of rehabilitation would make them more likely to hire someone with a conviction, that gives us a lot of hope and, and, and potentially a, um, a solution like the certificate would maybe be the nudge that employers need really to, to, to push that dial. Yeah, and I mean, I, th I think it's a reasonable, you know, idea, you know, it's practical and, um, you know, at the end of the day, nobody can guarantee anybody's behaviour because, I mean, I've been a HR manager and a line manager for over 20 years and I've had some outrageous behaviour from people who haven't had a criminal record, you know, so there is no way to guarantee people are human beings and, you know, but I do think if 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 there was done on an evidence based approach where they actually made an approach to, you know, to the courts or to some other body, um, obviously there'd be an expense to this, but I do see it as a kind of a practical a practical way. Um, I remember there was a video that Shad Maroon uh, from Queens made about the whole idea that we ritualize convictions. So we have a courtroom, people dress up, they've got wigs and they've got gowns and you've got, you know, you are convicted. But then when you're rehabilitated, nothing happens. There isn't anything. It's just the time is up. Do you know kind of way? So it'd be, it'd be good to kind of incentivize rehabilitation a bit more as well, um, that people would maybe feel proud of themselves, you know, that, you know, yeah. The shame that comes with the conviction could be, you know, sort of met with, you know, the the incentive there to, to be recognised as somebody who has partaken properly in society. Fantastic. And then in terms of the second part to that question, so are there barriers to accessing education and training qualifications for people with convictions? Perhaps that's one, Duncan, for you. Yeah, I mean, clearly uh, in, in real terms, there have been historically issues around people's in the interruption of people's learning and uh, some people have gone to deal with no qualifications and so on but sometimes prison has been a, a starting point for people uh, but uh, and and have, and obviously famously people have had degrees inside prison and come out of them I think also in terms of the university that we are very keen to widen access as far as possible uh, to as many people as possible and certainly we would take the same approach, which is that we, of course, have to check safeguarding issues, but we would want to move to a personal approach to make sure that everybody could have uh, the education that they need. We understand that education is a really, really critical tool and a vehicle through which people can move from one place to another in their lives. And that's not just people who've been in prison, that's everybody. So it's actually a huge contribution, a really important contribution. And we know, in fact, I know uh, personally, there are uh, lecturers now in the university, people being promoted who have in their earlier life been in prison and that has not interrupted in the long run their career and been a huge opportunity and they bring some of that experience into their teaching. So these are at all different levels ways in which the university is very keen to ensure that we make possibility and we meet potential where we can and we make possibility open where we can. So it's certainly something which we should look at and where it's not possible, we uh, should think about it and reflect on what we can do with our own uh, our own systems. Great, thank you, Duncan. Um, Michael, a comment for you then. Um, so Julie says, let's hope they are, these people are the backbone of Belfast going forward. Love this, Michael, and it's a great point to leave with. If we don't give people a future option, they will continue to live their lives in the past. We will not address support and help decrease reoffending. So that's a, a point in support of, of one of the points that you made, Michael, in the video. Is there anything you'd like yeah, to add? I mean, that, that, that's um, that, that's that's the bottom line. I don't think people can be judged on on the past and just talking about that some lecturers have actually been in uh, in and and served some time. And uh, yeah, I've, I've known lots of people have done that, and has never made any difference whatsoever. But I think we need to have a, a different thinking. And let, let's remember where we're from. We're from Belfast City. We're from Northern Ireland. There's a lot of people have maybe been in prison who shouldn't have been there. A lot of people have made mistakes overnight, and I don't think it should really affect the rest of their lives. And, if, uh, you know, I think there's big opportunities here, um, especially on the back of furlough.
where it's taught people who don't want to work anymore, who have maybe had jobs for years, and also on the back of leaving the European Union, where we're not able to get anybody from from abroad, and um, that we've lost the backbone of a lot of our good people. So I think there's lots of opportunities there, and people should grasp them and take hold of them, and they'll be very welcome. Thank you, Michael. That's brilliant. Um, so then Stephen had a couple of questions. So can the panel advise on supportive self-concept theories or career guidance resources for young adults transitioning from youth detention back into community for career development? Oh, that's a good one. Um, well, there are, there are a number of programmes. There's a number of organisations like NACRO has uh, the Working Well programme, uh, Extern, uh, Star360, Advantage. Um, I'm going to forget somebody, but there are a number of charities uh, and third sector organisations providing resources. Princess Trust would also do as well. So yes, there are there are agencies. I think what we what might come out of these conversations later on is probably maybe more partnership working to do with maybe making more specialised support is available and um, we were a big fan of working with different organizations like obviously we work with access and i doj the colleges and um, other organizations so it'd be nice to see some sort of collaborative work come out of this and um, with that with it's a very good suggestion and um, but i suppose in terms of mainstream advice there probably isn't a whole pile do you know kind of way but yeah we you justice would be there as well so Thank you. And then Stephen also says, likewise, any good resources, links on disclosing convictions or custodial sentences served? So you talked a bit about that before, Johnny. Yeah, so we we actually offer uh, training for employers. Um, I will be sending out details of a workshop I'll be running for in a couple of weeks time. I run them quite regularly just to, uh, because my background is HR. I can go through the HR process of policies, procedures, what questions to ask, the legal questions I can ask um, can be asked. Um, we, yeah, there are quite a, quite a number of resources, and again, um, the pandemic set us back a wee bit because you know we got we got the survey results, we had a load of stuff planned, and then we kind of went we're thrown into survival mode and working from home. So we're now coming back out of that, and we're hoping to make a lot more resources. That disclosure calculator will be online soon, thanks to Sean in Elite Training, and that that is for anybody. So that could be a, a prison staff member, it could be an employer, it could be a person with a conviction themselves. They can go in and honestly just put in the details of the um, outcome of the court case and the dates and it will actually tell you when it's spent. So we're, we're excited about that. Great, thank you. And then a comment from Billy for Duncan. I think Duncan hit the nail on the head. Every two people are not alike. Everyone's personal experience will mould them and in many ways, and can be very positive. Many people develop incredibly from a custodial sentence, so we need to be prepared to recognise those with convictions. And I think just in light of Billy's comment there, it is important to say that, you know, there are only 11% of, of those with convictions who have served a custodial sentence. But regardless, I think they're, you know, Billy's point there about how people are moulded by their experience is very important. Well, I think uh, we know that. Uh, in every aspect of education is that the person who comes into university is very often not the person who leaves. But also, as I said in the parole commission, every time um, you're considering a case, you can't go with any thoughts about what's going to be presented to you in advance because each person, each situation is different. The prospects, the possibilities, and they depend on all sorts of things. But what we're always looking for uh, at an educational level is Enthusiasm, exactly as Michael said, what you're looking for is somebody who fits the role, uh, but also somebody who has done uh, evidence, their work that they've done in advance. And it's not that different, really, in rehabilitation. I think it's somebody who has clearly made, you know, steps, taken steps in their life to change things, but also has evidence that they're looking for ways forward. So in all of these things, I think it's a question of getting past the label and looking at what reality is in front of you. And that's why I think, you know, when we see this uh, research and look at what people have said here, that they are frightened, uh, for example, or that they have concerns that, that, that about, you know, how they do it, but are enthusiastic to do it. The only way to bridge that is actually to build down this notion of ex-prisoner or somebody with a record into somebody sitting in front of you applying for a job who can demonstrate to you possibly very well that they're very keen for what's going on or in educational terms that they're the right person to do a course. So absolutely, I think this is really important. Thank you. 
Great, there's some really lovely insight here from Laura Lee. So she says, thank you for sharing this research in the film. Great discussion. I am a recruitment consultant and we have excellent policies in place. However, we have recently seen a number of clients requesting access NI checks for roles that would not usually require this check. For example, non-service user facing roles. Do you have any advice on how we can open this conversation without the client feeling we are not being fully compliant and safe? And I know this is something that Sarah raised previously. So perhaps between Sarah and Johnny, you would like to, to answer that one. Sarah, do you want to go first? Hi. Um, yes, I think I think it's probably a very valid point. And I guess it is about trying to, you know, you're being paid a fee to do a job. So you want to make sure you're doing what your client is asking you to do. But I think you could go down the route of inclusivity and diversity and making sure that, you know, trying to encourage them to have a more inclusive and diverse workforce thinking about the fact that not all job roles do need to have checks done. So you could talk about regulatory positions um, and, and requirements of legislation and that, you know, the role that they're discussing does not have one of those on them. So there's no need to do the check. Um, I think it's about looking at untapped talent, widening the net to say, you know, there's a whole bundle of people that you may well automatically excluding from applying because you're asking about these checks and the right person for the job could be one of those people. So untapped talent, I would say, is a really probably an important one and inclusivity and diversity would be the way I would go. Thanks, Sarah. The other thing I would say is I would speak to Access and I because they're very accessible uh, and open and we work very closely with them. And there has to be a legal basis to do the different levels of checks. Like any any employer can get a basic check done, but to get a standard or enhanced check done, um, it needs to satisfy Access and I's criteria. So in that case, I would be going back to Access and I and with the with the job description, with the role, and saying, does this qualify? And um, because you know it, it has to meet the threshold. You know. Great. Okay, thank you. Roshing then says, what kind of in work support is currently available from support organisations to to assist employers to help these employees settle into the workplace? I've got a very good one. Uh, Roisin Sloan is on the call here today. She's from uh, the department and she is heading up the Job Start programme and we will be sending out a link to that uh, as well. I don't know if you've heard about Job Start, but it's an incentivised uh, six to nine month placement uh, where the employer will be paid the minimum wage for 25 hours for to take on somebody with um, either a disability or um, a criminal a criminal record. Um, so. The Job Start program is a very good one because it, it means the employer can take on a staff member um, almost on a, on a trial basis. And obviously we would hope that that would turn into a full time job, but there, that's a financial incentive there for employers. So we're very happy to support the Job Start program. Thank you. And then there's a few comments in the discussion in the chat box that relate to the halfway house idea. So Kate says, really love that halfway house would be interested in this idea. Um, and Julie replies, the halfway house idea is in place for some people who are leaving prison. There are opportunities for some to go to work and return to prison for a number of months ahead of release. This helps phase people into work. But remember, we aren't talking about people who are necessarily inexperienced in the world of work. This could be a professional who now has to conclude who now has to disclose a conviction, but has worked for a number of years and held positions of responsibilities. And then Louise adds to that, good point, we people who are experienced in world of work already. Are there barriers to reskilling should a conviction exclude you from rules that have previously carried out? We have heard from Johnny and Duncan a little bit on this, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, Duncan, you have anything? Um, well, I mean, I think the halfway house idea is part of this issue of how do you evidence change and how do you make that possible? And I think the idea of the rehabilitation certificate is another way, you know, uh, at all points. The key thing here is that uh, we're not keeping people at the worst point in their life just because something happened and that there isn't a, there is an opportunity to move forward. And I think education has always been about the future it's been always been about the opportunity to do that so anything which eases that journey which makes it more uh, possible but also changes the way people think about people and the opportunities that might be offered is positive in this regard so um these are all uh pr probably ideas which need to be thought about and and then uh some kind of ladder possibly put in place which allows people to 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 move up a ladder very clearly as johnny said to give a sense of progress or to give a sense that you know normality is returning 
Great, thank you. Um, and Richard in the chat actually has a really good suggestion here. So attendees might be interested in a transitional employment model. We operate through our organisation, the Turnaround Project. Using two social enterprises, we employ people leaving the justice system on a part time basis for up to 12 months, including a period before and after they complete their sentences. This allows people to gain experience in a real world environment and receive coaching and other support, as well as signposting to other services, NIACRO, Prison Service and Probation Board help us to identify people for whom this could make a real difference. So if he, Richard, sorry, just yes, it's Richard. Richard's been very kind here and said that if there are employers on this call who'd be interested in talking about this as an opportunity to get in touch. And Richard has included his email address and number in the chat box. So I just encourage you to go in there and have a look. And if that's if that's you as an employer, to get in touch with Richard too, as well as Niacro. Then we have another question in, um, or a comment from Stephen. So some sure. of the chat. Hey, um, that that is another way in which actually we and the universities might be able to do some things as well, because I know actually Richard personally and uh, he works with a project called Big Loop Bikes, which has been used to kind of uh, offer a, a range of services. And I know that uh, it's something that we uh, are all interested in and how, how would you uh, create opportunities for also connecting in with universities also as places where people have purchasing power. So that's also interesting. Great. And then just one more. Um, it's great to see people's insight because it really widens the discussion here and, and, and you know, programmes that are already sort of complementary and already in train. So Julie says, I manage a project based in Hyde Bank. We work with young male offenders on their employability skills, deliver credit OCN qualifications and to get work experience in our social enterprise. Julie has also been really kind and included her email address in the chat box for anyone who, who might be interested in that. So I'm going to just close the chat there for now. I'm just very conscious we've got two minutes left um, in our timetabled event today. I think some of the other questions um, that are further down the chat have been answered by Johnny already, but please, I would encourage you all to get in touch with Johnny, with Duncan, um, Michael may, may be open to take some questions as well. We will circulate our contact details with the video that you've seen today to launch the research um, and with the research pack itself and the recording of this to everyone so that you can seek more information and you can take time to digest it at your leisure. So Johnny, I'll hand back to you then for closing thoughts. Yeah. So again, just like to say thank you to everyone today for coming along. Um, our hope in doing this research was to get a conversation started and to get many conversations started. And we're not the only ones having these conversations, but it's it's brilliant just to see so many um, people on today. And um, very, very, appreci very much appreciative of people giving us their time. As I say, my, my hopes for this would be that uh, people would now start to have collaborations and conversations to see how we can kind of make things uh, better for people who who genuinely want to rehabilitate and genuinely want to move forward their lives. And again, just really, we are not just talking about prison, although that's a, a big part of it. We are talking about professionals who, who may have gone into trouble um, personally or, or professionally and um, who who now want to kind of um, come back, come back into the fold, as it were. So um, we will be following up and um, there's a feedback uh, link uh, will be sent out to you as well. We would really appreciate your feedback on the event and uh, we'll just close it up there. Is that OK? And uh, thank you for attending today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Good, good to hear from you. Thanks, guys. No problem. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Duncan.